So um, thank you very much for uh, giving me the opportunity with uh, renowned faculties from across the world. And uh, I'm proud to be here uh, with you all because I think uh, mega learning is a very big platform and it's a very uh, renowned academic platform where we can discuss with all the knowledgeable peoples and all the participants and attendees from uh, different critical care and anesthesia and uh, uh, all, I think the, uh, we are uh, in resident also, they are uh, having this opportunity. So uh, today uh, we have um, uh, eminent faculties with us. Uh, we have uh, three faculties with us, but uh, first I want to introduce uh, Professor um, uh, So we will uh, go for the first lecture. So um, Dr. Doyle is uh, uh, with the Department of General Anesthesiology. Cleveland Clinic as well as Professor of Anesthesiology at the Cleveland Clinic Learner College of Medicine of Case Western Reserve University. Dr. Doyle received his MD degree in 1982 and his PhD degree in Biomedical Engineering in 1986 both from the University of Toronto. He received his Canadian board certification in anesthesia in 1986 and his American certification in 1989, Dr. Doyle has a long-standing interest in ENT anesthesia and different airway management, as well as an interest in the use of technology in medicine. His research has been supported by a number of uh, funding agencies, and he holds position on a number of editorial boards. Dr. Doyle is past president of both the Society of Airway Management and the Society for Technology in Anesthesia. He has received clinical teaching awards on four occasions. So today, Dr. Joel with us with a uh, lecture on laser application in anesthesia. So welcome, Professor Joel. Uh, uh, I think we will learn from him. So welcome, sir. Well, thank you very much for the kind words. Let me get started with the uh, screen share. And the presentation will be entitled Surgical Lasers and Fire Safety. And I'll be focusing on clinical and technical issues. The objectives of this presentation is to understand how operating room fires occur and how to manage them, understand the types of surgical laser and their safety concerns, understand how to avoid and manage intraoperative laser complications, and understand how to avoid and manage delayed or post-operative laser complications. So I want to begin with a discussion on fire safety. And a good place to start there is to understand the fire triad, because for a fire to occur, you need three things. You need fuel, such as a drape in the operating room or wood in your fireplace. You'll need an oxidizer, such as oxygen, but nitrous oxide also supports combustion. And finally, you need an ignition source, such as electrocautery, or a laser. So we're going to take a look at some of these things, focusing on what to do about uh, fires and how it pertains to laser safety. The Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation have, uh, has offered us an OR fire prevention algorithm, where you start by determining if the patient is at risk of a surgical fire. This involves procedures uh, above the head, neck, and upper chest above T5, and the use of an ignition source in proximity to an oxidizer. If that's um, a concern, then the next question is, does the patient require supplemental oxygen? And they recommend that if more than 30% supplemental oxygen is required, the use of an endotracheal tube or subglottic device may be appropriate, but most patients will not require more than 30% oxygen for a procedure done under topical or local anesthesia. Many agencies have provided us guidance in this matter. The uh, Association of Operating Room Nurses, for example, in 2005 offers these standards, recommended practices pertaining to fire prevention in the operating room, and this is available online. Begin from the beginning oh. again. Yeah. Uh, we're going to focus on laser uh, safety and fire safety, fires in the operating room and things pertaining to this. And a good place to start is with the objectives. We want to understand how operating room fires occur, how they're managed 
how they pertain to laser safety, how to manage interoperative laser complications such as a fire, and how to avoid and manage delayed postoperative laser complications such as airway edema. So let's start off with fire safety. And a good place to recognize the importance of fire safety is with understanding the fire triad. The fire triad consists of fuel, oxidizer, and an ignition source. Fuel can be a drape, for example, or wood in a fireplace. Oxidizers can be oxygen or nitrous oxide, which supports combustion. And for ignition, we could have, for example, uh, electrocautery or a laser. The, uh, Merrick, uh, the Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation has offered us an algorithm for understanding uh, how to approach the patient who's at risk of uh, surgical fire. And these patients are procedures involving the head and neck and upper chest above T5, where there's use of an ignition source in proximity to an oxidizer. If this patient requires supplementary oxygen over 30%, they recommend the use of an endotracheal tube or a supraglottic airway device uh, so that uh, the oxygen is not made concentrated in the area where the surgery is taking place. But most patients will not require more than 30% oxygen in this setting with uh, regional anesthesia or with a field block. The Association of OR Nurses has offered us a guidance statement uh, called Fire Prevention in the Operating Room from 2005 called Standards, Recommended Practices, and Guidelines that can be very helpful. In addition, there's a variety of other resources which I'll bring to your attention from time to time throughout this discussion. An important thing to remember is that when a fire occurs, prior drills or practice will be very helpful to ensure safety. The proper response of each surgical team member in the operating suite staff should be remembered. The surgeon should remove the burning material, such as the drape. The anesthesia provider should disconnect the patient breathing circuit. The nursing personnel should extinguish the burning material with a fire extinguisher and alert suite staff so that other people can come and provide assistance. And the patient will typically be moved to another operating room if uh, appropriate. We should know the location, operation, and coverage of the medical gas shutoff valves, uh, and also the operation of the electrical supply panels. So there is a variety of uh, uh, DVDs that are available from the American Patient Safety Foundation and other sources showing how a fire drill might be conducted, and this should be done from time to time so that people are comfortable with a fire, fire drill should a fire occur. We recommend a variety of safety considerations involving fire sprinklers, the use of smoke management systems, the presence of firefighting equipment like fire extinguishers, the arrangement of uh, lo uh, water in appropriate locations, automatic fire detection and alarm systems, emergency exit routes that are carefully um, uh, uh, labeled, and uh, ventilation systems and ducts filled with dampers to control the flow of air. And these are some of the safety considerations that apply in any clinical locale. One thing you should know is that when you are extinguishing a fire, there are various kinds of fire extinguishers. And typically they are class A, B, or C. Class fire, uh, A fire extinguishers will cover wood, paper, cloth. Uh, class B is for flammable liquids. Uh, an example would, uh, would be ether or alcohol. Class C for electrically energized fires. And some fire extinguishers are good for only one of these classes. Some of them are good for all three and they are labeled on the side of the fire extinguisher. To operate an extinguisher, we recommend pass, which is pull the pin, aim the nozzle at the base of the fire, squeeze the handle, and then sweep the nozzle from side to side. And there's videos on that on the internet showing how that's done. For uh, many people involved in facilities management, you'll wanna be aware of some of the many standards and guidelines, either from the American National Standards Institute pertaining to the safe use of lasers or from the National Fire Protection Association, in particular, uh, fire standard number 99 towards the bottom, the standard for healthcare facilities published in 2002. And these provide detailed guidelines uh, and testing methods to ensure a safe environment. One thing that uh, all fires require as an ignition, and the three most common ignition sources involved in operating fires are lasers, the electrical surgical unit, ESU, and high intensity light cords. And in the past, sparks from nylon or similar garments would occasionally ignite cyclopropene or ether used as anesthetics, but neither of these drugs uh, are in common use uh, pretty much anywhere in the world. 
Cyclopropane in particular is very explosive uh, and has resulted in a number of deaths uh, and uh, it is no longer in clinical use. Uh, here's an article from 1955 in the journal called Radiology talking about anesthetic explosives, cyclopropane, ethylene, vinyl ether, divinyl ether, and ethyl chloride examples of explosive agents. And they recommend uh, avoiding them in fire hazardous arenas. Those that will not explode are burn or chloroform, nitrous oxide, and trichloroethylene. And of these, only nitrous oxide is in common use today. So electrocautery is one source of ignition, and we'll be talking about lasers as another source of ignition in a little while. Uh, here is an example of rocket-like flames shooting from a tracheal tube caused by laser ignition of the tube with 100% oxygen flowing. And you can see uh, that can be very dangerous indeed. So we'll talk about what to do about airway fires in a little while. Here's something that's interesting, and this is a man who was uh, given extensive oral nutrition uh, through the Ensure liquid. And at the time of his uh, surgical procedure, uh, a stapled uh, colon was opened by electrocautery. A loud explosion occurred due to methane in the bowel, producing a 10 centimeter rent in the serosa of the colon. So uh, methane gas caused by appropriate diets, in this case from Ensure, uh, was responsible for the buildup of uh, methane in the colon and an explosion. The National Protect uh, Fire Protection Association has a number of standards I'd also like to bring to your attention pertaining to smoke control, standards for ventilation control, uh, standards for healthcare facilities uh, in FPA 99 that I mentioned earlier, and these are useful guidelines for people who are looking for standards for their hospitals. In Cleveland Clinic, uh, where I work, uh, one of the things that they did because of a fire that occurred uh, about 10 years ago now, uh, is that they re removed flammable skin preparation solutions, uh, and they removed chloroprep, duraprep, hippoclins, and alcohol mixed together, uh, but you're still allowed to use betadine gel and betadine solution. Uh, so because of concerns about fire hazards, certain pre skin preparations have been removed from our hospital. Some fire safety tips. Uh, fighting any fire requires judgment and tactics. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, training uh, with fire drills can be very uh, important. Always let someone know there's a fire and fire alarms are one way of doing it. Voice communication is another way. Test the extinguisher before entering a live fire. And always keep the wind at your back when you're fighting outdoors. This increases the likelihood the fire will be pushed in your direction. If you happen to catch fire, stop, drop, and roll. And this is something we teach all our children early in school. Three phases to a fire. If you smell the smoke, investigate, let people know. A smoldering fire is a small fire that can be easily extinguished with just a glass of water, coffee, or soft drink and you can take care of it right away in most cases. But a working fire is larger, they're code red, and they require more management, and that's why we have our fire drills. If you do hear a fire alarm, do not immediately evacuate, but contact the uh, individuals responsible. The fire warden on the floor will grab the fire extinguisher and go to the location of the fire and assess the situation. So that's why uh, we uh, designate fire wardens in every operating room and every fire um, Approach any fires cautiously, have a backup person with you to assist where necessary. As a rule of thumb, fight no fire that is larger than a typical card taper surface, or if you're making no headway into the fire. Uh, to uh, handle uh, a fire, remember this acronym RACE, R for rescue, rescue the victim, A for alarm, activate the alarm at the nearest pull station, C, contain, Close the door to the affected area and close all doors in your area to contain the fire and then extinguish or evacuate as appropriate. Now let's move on to one of the sources of fire in the operating room that's a true concern and, and that's uh, lasers. And lasers are used ubiquitously in anesthesia and surgery. Uh, and so I would like to talk about that for a while. A laser is a device that controls the way that energized atoms release photons or light. It's an acronym for light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. Although Albert Einstein proposed the idea of stimulated emission in 1917, translating the idea into a working model required another four decades of work. And in 1960, the American physicist Theodore Mann of Hughes Aircraft Corporation constructed the first working laser from a ruby rod. 
And then a variety of different lasers have been developed since then. Now let's compare ordinary light with laser light. Ordinary light is polychromatic, has a number of wavelengths. It's incoherent, it has a number of uh, wave fronts and it's multi-directional going off in all directions as illustrated by the two panels below. By contrast, laser light is monochromatic, has a single wavelength. And typically this wavelength is in nanometers, for example, 800 nanometers. It is coherent uh, that it has a single wave front and it's unidirectional, only going in one direction instead of being. Realm lasers are used ubiquitous, ubiquitously, as you can see. Uh, CO2 lasers are used in dermatology, plastics, general surgery, neodymium uh, YAG lasers also used in neurosurgery, gastroenterology, argon lasers used frequently in ophthalmology, as well as krypton lasers used in ophthalmology. We'll have to take a look at some of these, but the various lasers have different characteristics in terms of how deep they go and the kinds of complications that can occur. Let's begin with the carbon dioxide laser, which has one of the biggest wavelengths. It's over 10,000 nanometers. <clears throat> because of its large wavelength, it's invisible. So it's used with a visible helium neon targeting laser. So you can see what's going on. Widely used in ENT and gynae surgery, very precise, but only superficial penetration. It's not able to be transmitted fiber optically. So special arrangements are needed. And injury to the eye, if it occurs, can find only to the cornea. The argon laser, by contrast, uh, has much smaller wavelength, 488 and 514 nanometers for the blue and green varieties. It can be transmitted fiber optically, absorbed by hemoglobin and pigmented tissues. Because of its lower um, uh, wavelength and higher frequency, it has potential for retinal damage. It's used both in ophthalmology as well as in dermatology and plastics. Used sometimes for the removal of port wine stains and hematoma tattoos because the laser pigment absorption by hemoglobin and other pigments. The ruby laser used for ophthalmic surgery primarily at nine, uh, 694 nanometers, it's red. It's uh, readily absorbed by pigments such as melanin and by hemoglobin, easily penetrates the interior structures of the eye, which can cause retinal uh, damage, but usually used to photocoagulate vascular and pigmented uh, lesions in the retina. So that's the ruby laser. Helium neon laser, as I mentioned earlier, is red, harmless and less directed in the eye and often used in an aiming beam for lasers that uh, have very large wavelengths and are infrared. The uh, neodymium YAG laser has a wavelength of just over a thousand nanometers. It's infrared, but it can be transmitted fiber optically, causes photocoagulation plus thermal necrosis. The key thing about it is that it's high level of tissue penetration, and that makes it more prone to late complications. It can emit radiation in the visible range by using frequency doubling uh, using the KTP laser. And if you do that, the wavelength goes down to 532 nanometers, it becomes green. It too can be transmitted fiber optically uh, and some scatter and necrosis, but less than with the uh, neodymium lag laser and less uh, tissue penetration. So that's another commonly used laser. Uh, the neodymium lag laser uh, laser is, uh, sometimes causes coagulation of proteins, provides the deepest penetration among the laser medical lasers, and that results in delayed complications like perforation, hemorrhage, and pneumomeniastinum. Uh, and there's an article of the British Journal of Anesthesia from 1988 that describes some of the complications that can occur with this kind of laser. So just to summarize, the CO2 laser beam has uh, the uh, uh, least penetration, it just vaporizers. The argon laser beam is used for the coagulation of uh, hemoglobin-rich tissue. And the uh, neodymium YAG laser causes the coagulation of tumor tissue as the deepest degree of penetration. Now, of course, you want to use safety goggles or safety glasses to protect your eyes as well as protect the patient. To protect the patient, we typically cover the eyes with uh, saline-soaked gauze and then tape it. For operators, uh, we have glasses of this kind, and they filter out various frequencies depending on which specification you get. So depending on the laser, uh, if it's, a, for example, one which is in the infrared region, you'll want one that uh, filters out, for example, 1100 to um, um, 1115 nanometers, whereas some of the uh, ultraviolet ones and violet ones and red ones will require uh, 
lower wavelength units. So the glasses that you get will depend on the laser that you use. Now, a big concern we have, of course, is airway fires during surgery. Airway surgery that uses ignition sources like an electrosurgical unit or the laser is sometimes at risk. And this is particularly true when you're using oxygen enriched environments. This can happen during a tracheostomy. And so you should establish protocols to address when electrosurgery will be removed from the surgical field. You want to get rid of the electrical surgical unit from the field when the tracheostomy tomb is placed on the surgical field. And do not use the cautery to cut tracheal rings and enter the airway instead of using scissors or scalpel to avoid the risk of fire. If an airway fire occurs, I have some recommendations here. And that is you want to discontinue the uh, gas by disconnecting the patient breathing circuit. That's the easiest way to stop the gas flow. Remove the tube from the patient so the endotracheal tube comes out. Extinguish the fire by various means. Uh, this might include the use of a 60 cc syringe filled with saline. Remove segments of the burned tube that remain in the airway and then reestablish the airway and resume ventilating with air until uh, you're certain there's nothing left burning. And then when you can do that, switch to 100% oxygen. Now, of course, if the patient is a difficult airway and it was difficult to get the tube in in the first place, you may have to reconsider the uh, importance of removing the tube from the patient. As a matter of judgment, makes this whole thing very complicated, making it all the more important that airway fires do not occur in the first place. The American Society of Anesthesiologists have some guidelines that I would bring to your attention in this matter. They have a practice advisory for the prevention and management of operating room fires, and it comes from anesthesiology from 2013. And uh, the key to this, and uh, I recommend everyone download this article from the internet to get this particular uh, algorithm. This is the operating room fires algorithm from the American Society of Anesthesiologists. And they begin by recommending that you avoid ignition sources in proximity to oxygen enriched atmosphere, configure surgical drapes to minimize the accumulation of oxidizers like oxygen or nitrous oxide, avoid sufficient drying time, moisten sponges uh, uh, when used in the proximity to ignition sources, and then decide whether it's a high risk procedure. And if there is a high risk to this, then they have a box showing various things that should be done for patients with or without a tracheal tube. Um, and in either case, if you have a fire, you have to halt the procedure. And if a fire is present in the airway, you want to immediately remove the tracheal tube, stop the flow of airway gases. If it's a not an airway fire, you'll stop the flow of all airway gases, remove the drapes, and extinguish the burning materials by pouring saline or other means on. And then you continue on as this algorithm shows. One of the things we'll talk about in a little while is how, what is the uh, treatment of the airway after a fire occurs? And that would include, for example, bronchoscopy. So complications of lasers, particularly neodymium YAG lasers can occur. Here is a study from CHEST from 1984, where they had uh, laser treatment of uh, 839 patients resulting in six post-operative deaths. And the major causes of deaths were hypoxemia and perforation. And you get uh, perforation of tissues from the laser and sometimes hypoxemia from edema of the airway. Here's a, a report, this one from uh, our own place, the Cleveland Clinic Foundation from Dr. Basim Abdemalik, one of my colleagues. Respiratory arrest after successful neodymium YAG laser treatment for subglottic stenosis. So it can occur sometime afterwards. And so prolonged stay in the ICU or, uh, or in the operating room or in the uh, post anesthetic care unit or in the ICU can be value. Uh, in this study, they looked at the various kinds of complications that can occur. Uh, when a complication occurs, about a quarter of them are perforation of organs or vessels. About a quarter are gas emboli, exposure to eyes, airway fires, and other burns can occur in miscellaneous as well. So about 14% uh, are airway fires, and this is something that you should be familiar with in terms of having a pre-prepared algorithm, such as the one from the American Society of Anesthesiologists. Hazards uh, in the operating room for lasers involve the potential for tissue damage and combustion uh, of, uh, for example, the drapes. You'll want to avoid instruments with polished mirror-like surfaces because reflected laser beams can cause uh, injury, and that's why we wear the safety goggles. And any instrument that becomes hot as a result of laser radiation can cause burns, and you'll want to be careful in that context as well.
Eye injury is a particular concern, and that's why we uh, recommend uh, eye protection. Never look directly into the beam, of course. Conventional eyeglasses are adequate only for CO2 lasers. And so for all the other kinds of lasers, you need special eye protection, particularly for argon, KTP, neodymium lag lasers. Uh, and the eye protection for them will depend on the wavelength of the light involved. And for the patients, you cover the eyes with moist eye patches and then tape them in place. Atmospheric contamination is another concern when using lasers. Vaporization of tissue cause a plume of smoke with fine particles. It can be offensive or irritating, but perhaps worse, it can be a vector for viral spread, such as condylomas. CO2 lasers produce the most smoke, uh, smoke secondary to vaporization of tissue. You need to have a smoke evacuator at the surgical site along with protective masks, which filter out particles to protect the OR environment. A sign such as this uh, is something that should be outside the operating room door to remind people. Uh, place plaque coverings on any operating room window because argon and neodymium YAG lasers can penetrate windows. Disposable drapes are treated with flame retardant but are difficult to extinguish once they are lit. So this, this is an example of a kind of safety uh, um, plaque that you can put outside the room uh, to protect people. And frequently we have the extra goggles hanging on the door for anyone who wants to come in. Uh, one of the questions is, are there special airway techniques that can reduce fire risk? And each method has its own risks and benefits. The anesthesiologist and airway surgeon will jointly select the most appropriate method to the patient and the wavelength of the laser to be used. And whether you intubate or not will depend on circumstances. We'll have a chance to talk about both intubation and no non-intubation techniques. For non-intubation techniques, the advantages of no endotracheal tube is decreased risk of a fire, improved surgical access, but of course, the disadvantages include an unsecured airway and an aspiration risk. Sometimes we want the patient breathing spontaneously, or we may use apneic techniques, or we may use jet ventilation, all in the context of an unintubated patient. With the patient breathing spontaneously, this uh, can offer a number of advantages and disadvantages. There's a pulmonary risk disadvantage, difficult to assess the adequacy of ventilation in many cases. Ventilation cannot be assisted or controlled. And if you use anesthetic gases, it can be difficult to scavenge them. Uh, nevertheless, spontaneous breathing techniques can be useful, particularly when good topical or regional anesthesia is used. For apnea, apnea techniques are sometimes used. Uh, the patient's lungs are ventilated with a mask or through an endotracheal tube, uh, and then their uh, ventilation is withheld and a surgeon carries out his part of the procedure and then periods of ventilation alternate with periods of laser resection and apnea. Hypoventilation is a concern, pulmonary aspiration is a risk, and this is a technically difficult and sometimes annoying approach that many people would like to avoid uh, use of the apneic technique. More commonly, people will use a jet ventilation technique where a metal tube or similar device is mounted on the operating uh, laryngoscope and attached to a jet ventilator or jet injector, high velocity jet of oxygen is directed into the airway lumen, either above or below the glottis, depending on the circumstances. Uh, and then uh, room air is entrained as well. And typically this is done using uh, propofol uh, plus remifentanil supplemented by a muscle relaxant such as rocuronium. And then the jet ventilation is carried out. It's, it can be difficult in the setting to know how well you are ventilating them in some cases. Uh, and the whole business of jet ventilation is the subject of another a presentation which uh, uh, I would encourage you to attend. Some disadvantages of jet ventilation. Hypoventilation, as I mentioned, can be a problem. Difficult to know the adequacy of ventilation. Uh, inspired oxygen concentration cannot be controlled that well. Pulmonary aspiration is a risk because of the fact that it's an unprotected airway. Risks of gastric distension and particularly barotrauma, including pneumothorax, it can occur. And you can't administer inhalation anesthetics that easily. Um, and we typically use TIVA technique consisting of propofol and remifentanil along with neuromuscular blockade done with, uh, for example, rocuronium. If you intubate the patient, it's uh, uh, a bit easier uh, in terms of managing the airway, but it can be more difficult surgically uh, should the tube get in the way of the surgical site. With intubation techniques, ventilation can be monitored and controlled and IV as well as uh, inhalation agents can be used, but you run into the problem that the endotracheal tube could catch fire. If you use a conventional tube, 
uh, such as a polyvinyl chloride tube or a silicon tube, they are highly combustible. And of course, that's a problem. And so you have to use a, a safer tube. Uh, conventional tubes, again, uh, although they do not reflect laser light, they are quite combustible, particularly in the presence of enriched oxygen environments. And they can produce toxic uh, products of combustion, which are toxic to human tissue. So sometimes people protect a conventional tube with a uh, metal wrap, such as shown here. The metal wrapping may prevent the laser beam from igniting the tube. It still allows the use of conventional tracheal tubes. And uh, I remember 20 years ago, we used to do this from time to time, but I haven't used this in decades now because we're using special um, custom tubes, uh, such as flexometallic. So here's an example of that. The uh, laser flex is an airtight stainless steel spiral tube available in cuffed and uncuffed versions. Uh, the metal components are not flammable, uh, but these uh, uh, may be difficult to place using fiber optics for the difficult airway patient. And so like all of these, um, they can be difficult to use in, in special circumstances. Note that this has a, a double cuff. So if one bursts, you still have protection. Disadvantages, it may reflect the laser onto uh, non-targeted tissues resulting in damage. Cuffs are flammable, require the cuff be inflated with saline uh, to decrease the risk of ignition. They are double walled and the double cuff takes more time to inflate and deflate than a single cuff. And the metal may transfer heat to adjacent tissue. Uh, in all these cases, of course, we're giving oxygen. We should maintain the FiO2 to the lowest concentration necessary to get an acceptable saturation. The balance of the fresh gas flow should be nitrogen. In some cases, helium, but I haven't used helium in a long, long time in this setting. Inhalation agents may be added as clinically indicated, although most people uh, will simply use a total intravenous technique. Nitrous oxide, of course, should not be used because it supports combustion just like oxygen does. The saline-soaked uh, um, uh, saline filled cuffs can be very useful as protection against fire. Some people fill them not with saline, but with methylene blue diluted usually. Uh, so you have highly visible dye should the perforation occur. So that, that's something that we often do using diluted methylene blue in the cuffs so that if the cuff breaks, everyone can see it a moment. Saline soaked pledgets can be used to provide some protection for the cuff. They have to be layered sufficiently placed around the cuffs, and you have to make sure to retrieve the pledgets at the end of the operation to prevent a foreign body. Additional safety measures, you should use the lowest clinically acceptable power density for the laser and the shortest clinically acceptable pulse duration. Non-reflective operating platforms and other tissue protective devices should be used where possible. Now, we'll, let's go on to the anesthetic management here. Pre-medication, usually we use it only for the very anxious patient. Uh, patients should never be medicated and left alone. Judicious use of sedation is required, uh, but in small titrated doses. Intraoperatively, PIVA is our preferred technique. General endotracheal anesthesia required for most of these cases, but topical and sedation can be used in some. Muscle relaxant often required in an ilmoya field is required to allow precise airway measurements or accurate direction of the beam. Dexmedetomidine in those cases where regional anesthesia or topical anesthesia is used can be very helpful. It's a safe sedating agent for airway management, provides a degree of comfort without respiratory compromise, although further studies are needed to further fully clarify the rule of dexmedetomidine for managing complex airways. But my experience with it has been very positive. Uh, what are the kinds of cases that we use uh, a laser airway uh, for? Uh, examples include recurrent laryngeal papillomatosis, laryngeal cancers that have not spread, and endobronchial tumor resections. Uh, for example, here is some example of laryngeal cases that can be managed with a laser in some cases. And here's an endobronchial tumor that can be lasered away in some cases. Now, should an airway fire occur uh, and you put the fire out, uh, what do we do after that? Uh, as I mentioned, we resume ventilation by mask, but we also perform bronchoscopy to look at the degree of damage and reintubation may be necessary. The patient goes to the ICU and whether you should give steroids and whether you should administer antibiotics remain controversial and people will disagree vehemently about this. So in conclusion, if you have a 
laser case, discuss the case in advance with the surgical colleagues so you're all on the same page uh, as to uh, management. You have uh, an approach to deal with the fire if it occurs. Uh, for the anesthesiologist, a 60 cc syringe filled with saline uh, is a, should be readily available so you can put the fire out if needed. Know where your fire extinguisher is, know where you can turn off the oxygen if there is uh, a need for that. Be prepared, flexible in your plans, and be vigilant. This is the Cleveland Clinic where I work, and the motto here is every life deserves world-class care. Thank you so much for your time, and I'm now open for any questions. Thank you very much, Professor Doyle, for your uh, excellent lecture. Actually, I think we all enjoyed the lecture, and um, we uh, we are very we all know that the laser application for surgery and the challenges faced by the anesthesiologist is a very you know is a specialized field. So uh, I think uh, it's a very important topic, and Professor Joel uh, covered all the topic in a very I think in a uh, in a short time he covered all these things because of the ignition of fire safety tips and the different type of laser phases of fire way uh, the ways to fight airway fire and the main things the complications safety measure intubation techniques so uh, i think uh, it's a, a very specialized field so the thing is uh, uh, there is some uh, questions from our uh, attendees so first question, there is a can a laser smoke cause infectious hazard for operating room stuff? So uh, the patients uh, where there's a smoke plume that contains viruses, we recommend special evacuation techniques as well as special masks that uh, will filter out the virus, just like we use special masks to filter out COVID-19. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think uh, there is another question that is uh, how to monitor or manage a case in the post-op period in ICU. Is there any special, uh, like you you have uh, described very uh, shortly that the precautions and others, but is there anything special that we can do in post-op period? It's not special so much as it's routine, careful monitoring of the patient, particularly from the point of view of respiratory distress. So with some of these procedures, if the airway becomes edematous uh, and they may go into respiratory distress, we'll want to be able to intervene early recognizing that. That could involve the use of steroids, for example, uh, dexamethasone. It could involve the use of racemic epinephrine. It could involve the use even of heliox, a combination of helium and oxygen that could make breathing easier. Sometimes the patient will have to be reintubated before those uh, uh, interventions work. Sometimes you don't have to do that. The key thing is that the, in the ICU, you can keep a close eye the, on them, checking vital signs routinely instead of on the floor where vital signs and visits may be as infrequent as every four hours. Okay, yeah, it's a very, uh, I think, yes, uh, this is a very important uh, answer. Uh, and there's, uh, there is it, actually what happens is sometimes in uh, laser surgery that the close to or inside the airway, the surgeon and the anesthesiologist share the common area. So, uh, so what kind of planning, like understanding or partnership is required before or during the case? I mean, between the surgeon and the anesthesiologist. Well, very often the surgeon and the anesthesiologist have worked together uh, for years, and so they have a common plan. But what we often do is before the patient goes to sleep, we have a safety huddle where we identify the patient and uh, make sure that the consent is done. And at that point, we discuss clinical management, particularly airway management. So the uh, surgeon may say, uh, in this case, uh, I recommend that we use a uh, size 5.5 microlaryngeal tube, if that's okay with you. Uh, and um, that may be something that works well, or alternately he may or she may say, um, um, and a microlaryngeal tube would be too big to get in the way. Uh, so I want you to use jet ventilation. Are you okay with that? And you may respond saying, well, this guy has a BMI of 45. Uh, ventilation by jet is going to be very difficult. Are you really sure that this microlaryngeal tube won't work? 
Uh, and so you have this discussion going back and forth about the pros and cons of various techniques, and eventually you come to an agreement. Yeah. So uh, actually, we know this. The you you said uh, earlier also that the one of the main hazard is fire. So uh, I know the precautions are uh, you uh, take. And uh, is there anything like uh, if how to manage if it still happens? Like uh, necessary to prevent this fire? Actually, the hazards of fire, uh, the, the fire in actually. Uh, so when a fire occurs, uh, basically you launch a fire drill. And uh, the details of the fire drill are beyond the discussion here uh, in the sense that it requires special planning and videos. Uh, the Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation offers a video that you can get as well. Fortunately, on YouTube, there's a variety of videos showing how to uh, uh, manage a fire in the operating room and how to manage fires in hospitals. Uh, the key thing is that you're in an oxygen-enriched environment and you want to reduce the oxygen in the case of a fire, you'll want to disconnect the patient breathing circuit, ventilate with air. And if it's an airway fire, what you'll want to do is extubate the patient and just ventilate on room air as long as the saturation is okay. Uh, you also want to call for help and you may have to take the patient into another room. And then other people will have to put out the fire. And for that, you'll need to know uh, what fire extinguishers are available, what class of fire it is. For example, an electrical fire, which is class C, should be handled with um, a fire extinguisher that handles that. So there's a lot more to know, uh, which is why I provided so many references that may be useful. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Actually, I also have uh, lots of interest in this topic because it's very new to me also. And uh, I think uh, everyone was um, uh, very much interested to know uh, about all, uh, and I think in, uh, we will, next time we also uh, try to know more from you also, sir. But today we have uh, uh, another two lectures ahead. So I think we can close our first lecture here. Thank you very much, Professor okay. John Doyle. Thank and, you for your time. Uh, now I, uh, over to Dr. Yasser. Thank you.